Hi, this is our second video for chapter three, which covers sections three, four, and three, five, where we talk a little bit more about how to compare different sets of data and, well, and what the five number summary is. So let's start off with an example, building off the last one. So we have a six foot tall man who's talking to a six foot tall woman, and the woman says, wow, it's, it's difficult being this tall. And the man says, well, I'm the same height, and it's not that difficult at all. Now, obviously that sounds a little absurd. Uh, we know that there's a very different experience for a six foot tall man and a six foot tall woman. Obviously, they, even though they are the exact same height, their experience is not really the same. But how do we quantify that? How can I numerically explain that a six foot tall man really isn't as tall as a six foot tall woman? Where's that difference? The key is gonna be with talking about relative standing. Which one of them is going to be relatively taller? And the way we compare these relative standings is through what's called a Z-score. All a Z-score is, is it measures how far away from the mean a data point is in terms of the standard deviations. So because it's in terms of the means and the standard deviations, we can compare two completely separate data sets, look at the Z-scores and figure out which one is actually further away. So how do I actually calculate that? Well, to calculate the Z-score, which is again, that number of standard deviations away, First, you need to find that point's deviation from the mean. And if you remember from the last video, that means take the data point and subtract the mean, subtract mu, if we're talking about a population. Once you have that deviation from the mean, we divide it by the standard deviation and find that ratio. And that ratio will give us the z-score. Now again, I gave you the formula here for the z-score in terms of the population mean and population standard deviation, but we can easily do this for sample means and sample standard deviations as well. We would just use slightly different notation. So let's take a look. Let's actually find the z-scores for a six foot tall man, and then we'll do the six foot tall woman. So for men, the average height is 70 inches tall, right, five foot 10, with a standard deviation of three inches. So the first thing we want to do is take that sentence written in English and translate it into some math equations that are going to make it much more convenient for us to plug things in. And so the average is 70, so mu equals 70, standard deviation is 3, sigma equals 3, and we have our man who's 6 foot tall or 72 inches tall. So to find his z-score, again, we plug those in. Always do the subtraction first. You, know, you gotta do order of operations. If you just type it into your calculator the way it's written, you're going to get many, many wrong answers. And that is actually a huge issue with this section because that happens quite often. But you actually have to find that deviation from the mean. So if he's 72 inches tall, that means he's two inches taller than average, divided by the standard deviation, which is three. And so his z-score is two thirds, or if we're gonna round to decimals, 0.667 going out to three decimal places. So that means his height is only 0.667 standard deviations from the mean. His height is even within one standard deviation of the mean, which means he's pretty close to average. He's not that relative, he is taller than average, but not that much taller than average. For women, the average height is 64 inches with a standard deviation of four inches. So again, we should write all this out and say which variable stands for which value. And so mu is 64, so the average height is 64 inches. So clearly on average, women are shorter than men. The standard deviation is four, so sigma equals four, which this standard deviation is actually bigger. And what this means, since women have a bigger standard deviation, it means there's more dispersion. It means with women, you would expect to see women of different heights more frequently than men of different heights. You would expect women to have a much larger range of heights that seem normal. You'll have short women and tall women more often than you would see really short men or really tall men. But again, we wanna find that Z-score. So again, find that difference. The six foot tall woman should be 72 inches tall. So that's my X. And so 72 minus 64 is eight. We divide that by the standard deviation, which is four we get two, which means her height is two standard deviations away from the mean, which again is kind of obvious now that we look at it, right? The standard deviation is 
four inches. So if she's two standard deviations away, that would be four and four, which is eight. And sure enough, she is eight inches away from the mean. Now, since she has the bigger z-score, her z-score is two compared to the man who had a z-score of 0.667, she is relatively taller. And we're able now to compare two different data sets with two different means and two different standard deviations, but still compare them in a meaningful way using this z-score. Now, this z-score is so useful, it will pop up again later on in the course, again, when we get back to uh, inferential statistics. So make sure you kind of Keep this one in the back of your head for a while. Now, z-scores. We can have negative z-scores. Remember, we're plugging that into that formula. The deviation from the mean can certainly be negative, just like it was with the previous examples. And in this case, if you want to see who's further from the mean, you compare that absolute value. All right, or just you know, forget the negative sign. Who's further from the mean? So if you end up with a positive z-score or z is bigger than zero, that means you better have a data point that's bigger than the mean or above the mean. And if you have a negative z-score or z is less than zero, you're going to have a data point that's smaller than the mean or below the mean. If your z-score is zero, that means you are the mean. Your, that data value is equal to the mean. Let's take a look at another quick example. So I have five students who took a test. The students scored an 85, an 87, a 91, a 2, and a 95. I want to describe how the class did overall. Now, most of the times when you're trying to figure out how a class did, the first question students always ask me when they get their test back, what was the average score? What's the mean? All right, well, let's find the mean score of these five students and their tests. We know how to find the mean or the average. Add up all the scores and divide by how many scores there are. So add up all those scores, divide by five. The mean is 72. So if I look at that set of tests, would it make sense for me to say that on average, the class got a 72? The average was a C minus. The, the class average was a C minus. That's how the class did. Well, is that really a good description? Because if I look, I have a student with a B, a B plus, an A minus, and an A, and one student who got a two. So four of the five students got A's and B's, and one student got a two. So would it make sense for me to say that the entire class had an average of 72? Well, not really. I don't think so. There's got to be a better way to describe how the class did. And that's going to be the median. So if I want to find the median now, the first thing I need to do is, well, order the data, put it smallest to largest, and then look at the middle value, which in this case is 87. So my median score for the class was an 87. An 87 means that, well, half the class did worse than the 87, and half the class did better than the 87. And this is probably a much better way to describe how the class did as a whole. Again, I had two A's and two B's, and then that one score of a two. That one score of a two shouldn't really affect how I describe how my class did. My class did very well, except for one student, for whatever reason that might have been. And so the median is going to be a much better way to describe overall how my class did. And again, all it does is separate the data into the top half and the bottom half. Half the students did better than an 87, and half the students did worse than the 87. So a couple of definitions. Well, what happened here? Well, the thing is that that two, that score of two is clearly an outlier. Now, an outlier is an extreme observation or an extreme data value when compared to the rest, right? Everyone else scored in the 80s or 90s, and then that one student scored a two. That two is an outlier. That two, what it's going to do is really skew that data. And what happens with outliers is that outliers are really going to affect the mean. What outliers do is outliers pull that mean towards them. All right. So again, most of my class did well, but there's that one score of a two way, way down there on that lower end. It's pulling the mean over towards it. So it takes the mean all the way down to a 72, which again, really doesn't describe how most of the class did. Because it pulls the mean, well, the mean is how we calculate the standard deviation. 
That's also how we calculate the z-score. So all three of those measurements are going to be affected by those outliers. However, the median is resistant to the outlier because again, all the median does is separate the top half of the data from the bottom half. It doesn't care about the values in the top half or the bottom half. It just tells us what the middle is. So we say the median is resistant to outliers or we say that the median is robust because it can accurately describe the data with well, dealing with outliers like that number two. Now, we extend medians into this idea of called quartiles, where we take the median, like I said, it divides our data in half. So we have the top half and the bottom half of our ordered data. Now, if we divide each of those halves again, that's how we find our quartiles. And you kind of see from the image, we're essentially trying to separate our data into, well, quarters, into 25%. And so you'll see you always have the smallest value up to Q1, up to the median, which is sometimes called Q2. Uh, again, you might sometimes see the median called Q2 and then Q3 and then the largest data value or the maximum. Again, each one being separated by 25% of the data. This is actually what's called our five number summary. And so our five number summary consists of our minimum or smallest value, Q1, also called the first quartile, sometimes referred to as the 25th percentile, and it's going to be the median of the bottom half of the data. Then we have our median, which we've described quite a bit already. Then there's Q3, which is our third quartile, or the 75th percentile, and it's that median of the top half of the data, and then finally the maximum. The other value that we concern ourselves with when talking about the five number summary is the interquartile range. The interquartile range is our measure of disbursement when we're talking about things in terms of the median. And that interquartile range, very often just abbreviated as IQR, is the difference between quartile three and quartile one. Um, what's the distance between Q3 and Q1, which would be the middle 50% of the data, right? How much room does the, mi the middle 50% of our data take up? We use that five number summary to visually construct what are called box and whisker plots. And essentially what we want to do is have a scale at the bottom and we basically make a mark, either a hash or a dot, where the minimum is, where the lower quartile or Q1 is, where the median is, where Q3 or the upper quartile is, and then the maximum. Now, around from Q1 to Q3, we draw a box. So we do want to make those into uh, typically lines make that box with the again the median kind of in the middle there and that box represents our interquartile range or our IQR then we connect that box to the min and the max with what we call the whiskers so let's take a look at those scores of our Super Bowl so what we have here are the total points scored for the last 10 Super Bowls all the way up to the very last one all right, and I gave them a chronological order. Now, if I want to do the five number summary, the first thing I need to do is, well, order my data. So I'm going to put all my data into order. All right, and so now that it's in order, I can clearly see that my minimum value is 16, the smallest data value that shows up is 16. My maximum is 65, that's the largest data value that shows up. And I want to find my median. So that means I need my middle number, except, well, in this case, there's two middle numbers. There's no one value just exactly in the middle. And so I mentioned this in the last video that when this happens, our median ends up being the average of these two. So when I average 50 and 51, well, the average of 50 and 51 is 50.5. So my median ends up being 50.5. Now I want to find Q1. So Q1, I'm just going to consider the bottom half of the data. So I'm only taking the five smallest data values now. All right. There's 10 scores total. I want the bottom half of those bottom five. And now I want to find the median of those bottom five. Well, the median is the one in the middle. So clearly Q1 is going to be 44. To find Q3, I want the top half of the data. So now I look at the other half of my data here, right? The, the five largest values. And I find the median of this set of data. And the median here is 52, right there in the middle. Now, just a, a quick note. If we had an exact median, if we didn't have to average those two like we did, um, you know, if we didn't have to average 50 and 51, 
When you find the Q1 and Q3, you ignore that median value. All right, it is the exact middle. You leave it out when you compare the top half and the bottom half. So to summarize my five number summary, my minimum value was 16. I found Q1 was 44. My median was 50.5. Q3 was 52. And my maximum value was 65. And I drew my box and whisker plot here. So I made a dot at each of those values. And again, I need to make sure I include my scale. It doesn't matter if you don't include your, or it doesn't count unless you include that scale. You need that scale at the bottom. And so again, hopefully you can see that the minimum value, there's a dot at 16 and 44, 50.5, 52, and 65. And again, we make a box from Q1 to Q3. So that brings us to that question. Are there any outliers in this data? Is there anything in this data that would skew it one way or the other? Well, the way we find our outliers is actually we use the interquartile range. We use that IQR, that measure of dispersion, to create what are called fences. And our fences are going to be data values that are a distance of one and a half times that IQR from our box. All right, so from Q1 and Q3 on our plot. So our lower fence, we would start at Q1 and then we would subtract again one and a half times whatever our IQR is. Now, in this case, our IQR is eight. The, the difference between 44 and 52 is 8. And so Q1 was 44. And when I subtract 1.5 times 8, I'm going to get 32. Hey, this is a good place to review order of operations. Always do that multiplication first. 1.5 times 8 is 12. And then 44 minus 12 gives us that 32. This means that any data value smaller than that lower fence is an outlier and would skew our data. Well, if we look at that raw set of data, my minimum value was 16. So that means that total of 16 points is an outlier. That means that that Super Bowl of the Patriots versus the Rams was statistically an outlier and way more boring than a Super Bowl should ever be. We also want to take a look at the upper fence as well, see if there's any outliers on that side. And now we start at Q3 and then we're going to add one and a half times our IQR. So the IQR part's not going to change and we still know that it's eight. One and a half times eight is still 12. So we take Q3, which is 52 plus 12, we get 64. So any score higher than 64 would also be an outlier. And well, we did have a total of 65 points scored. So that is an outlier because it's bigger than the 64. Now it's only one point bigger than the fence, but that still makes it an outlier. All right, it's still an outlier just the way 16 was an outlier, even though obviously it's much further from the fence. Anything outside the fence is considered an outlier, no matter how far away it actually is. So. We can use box and whisker plots to also describe the shape of our distribution as well. And so if we make our box plot and the tail or the whisker is much longer on the right hand side, well, that means it's going to be skewed right. If my data is symmetric and again, the whisker on the left and the right are about the same, well, that's that's symmetric. It's you know a mirror image. And if the tail is much longer on the left-hand side, if that whisker is longer on the left-hand side, that means it's skewed left. Now, when we discuss distributions, the shape of the data determines which center and which dispersion would be the better measurements to use. If our data is symmetric, if we have that bell shape, we want to use the mean and the standard deviation because those are going to be incredibly useful when we, again, are working with probability and we try to combine the statistics describing numbers with, well, how likely it is that that small sample really describes my population. But if the data is skewed, well, we want to use the median and, and the IQR for our dispersion, because if the data is skewed, that mean is going to get pulled towards the tail and it's not going to be as accurate anymore. All right. Good luck with your homework. And let me know if you have any questions.